my thought of purpose of imaging is to confirm a clinical diagnosis and to see what else, if it's not the clinical diagnosis at mind, or if there are other additional problems, even if it's hypermobility and another level with degenerative changes. I want to be able to localize where problems are. I want to see how severe the problems are and be able to describe what other issues with abnormalities that I'm imaging. The issue with imaging is it's hoped to be an objective sort of a measurement, which it's never perfectly objective. But we look at a number of areas for abnormal motion. We can look at the head on top of the spine, which I'm not going to go over at this talk. We can look at the cervical spine for abnormal motion. And we can look at the lower spine, the thorax, and the lumbar spine. Other conditions that may cause neurologic issues, problems with pain, problems with function, can include Chiari malformation, which is the lower part of the brain coming through the brain stem, uh, coming through the skull base with compression of the brain stem and that lower part of the brain, the cerebellum. Syrinx, which is fluid. Stenosis, which is narrowing and segmentation abnormalities, which are developments where the bones in the spine don't grow properly. They're not formed properly early on in life. And for spinal instability, we want to have numeric values. We want to have a normal, a normal basis. We want to have something that we can look at between patients, we want to have something different operators can look at and repeat, and we want to be able to repeat it over time. It's useful to make decisions about how therapy is, whether it's conservative therapy and failing, or whether it's surgery. We want to be able to make sure if there's therapy that it's working properly. If people have surgery, we want to make sure the bones are healing. And it can help guide the next rounds of therapy. Historically, there's been a major attempt to have a range of normal or know what things are supposed to be. In the tra uh, trauma, there's a number of authors from the 1960s on who have looked at spine trauma because it took until the 60s to get good instrumentation and safe anesthesia for trauma patients to make a decision who should have something fused or stabilized versus who might heal on their own, particularly when there's ligamentous injuries rather than bone fractures. Another condition that movement in normal range is important is inflammatory arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is the model disease. And when there have been therapies, particularly surgery, we want to see how are they healing? How are, are things normal? Is it getting better? Sometimes people feel worse after surgery and it's a matter of figuring out why. This is a, a number of authors have been looking at normal range of motion for the cervical spine from the 1960s through I don't know, three years or four years ago. And I use criteria from Punjabi and White, their paper in 1975. And there's a number of measurements that we're able to make when people have pain, when people have headache, when people don't feel well. We can look at the top of the spine. Let's see if I can do. So this is the skull. This is C1. This is C2. That one rotates. The main, purpose, the main motion at that level is turning. So we can look with rotation. And we typically use CT. We can bend forward and back to see how things are sliding forward and back. We can use x-rays, fluoroscopy. It can be done with CT or with MR. We can do lateral tilting with x-rays or with fluoroscopy. And sometimes rotation is helpful. This is, again, an atlantoaxial instability. That's the first and the second cervical spine segments 
This is the skull. This is a piece of, this is C1. This is C2. And right, uh, you can't see it because it's hidden behind C1, is a projection. We call it the odontoid. That's a piece of C2. And we want to see, they rotate, and we want to see how they move. In addition, there's a little space between this guy, C1, and C2. And there's ligaments that support it. When those ligaments don't work, there's, a, there's abnormal motion, and that space can widen. And it's something we can measure. This is a reconstruction from a CT. This is somebody has turned their head, oh, excuse me, has has turned their head to the left. So this one is C1. It's one of the neck bones. This one is C2. So there's a lot of motion in between, 44 degrees. That's ligamentous instability or ligamentous failure. That's, not, that's much more than should be taking place. So that's between the top one and the second one. And that space between C1 and C2. This is normal. These are reconstructions from CT. This is C1. This is C2. There's not much space. That's normal. This is C1, the front of it, and this is that part of C2. There's a much bigger space in a less blurry image or a different image, you could see that it's pushing on the brain stem. But this space is abnormal. The ligaments have failed. This is showing where that would be taking place. These are, this is a plain x-ray that I might be looking at. And this is a blown up image of that same x-ray, just showing that pre-dental space. There's a little space between C1 and C2. This is what we measure. Flexion extension, that's bending forward and bending back. We can see how much movement there is in the angle between bending forward, there's not a great deal, and bending back. In this person, at that time, there was quite a bit. MRI is uh, useful for motion when we have upright flexion and extension images. The main advantage of MRI is we see soft tissue in addition to bone. And we can also look at the skull base. This is base of skull. It's not fully included. This is the brain stem, and this is the cervical spine. When there's abnormal motion, we can see that also. This is neutral. Person is standing up. It's not really pushed. There's no real issues, whereas when this person bent forward, there's a lot of angulation. The cord is pulled against it. And when they lean back, a piece of disc pushes out against the spinal cord. You don't really see that in the neutral position. And if they were laying flat, it also would not be seen. <coughs> CT can be used for measuring movement in the cervical spine. But we really only use it when people are too sick to sit up or stand up. This person was just not able to stand for the other x-ray modalities. And we can put pillows behind the head to get the bending forward, and pillows behind the shoulders to bolster their back, and they can tip backward. Um, this is a, 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 just an image that we, or a person's study that we've measured angulation just to show that we can go from each of the vertebral bodies and measure an angle or come up with an angle. And then in extension or bending back, it angles the opposite direction. And the difference between that is the total motion for that time. And again, we can watch if the vertebral bodies slide forward on each other. In addition to bending, if the ligaments are loose, they can actually slip forward or slip back. And that's what we measured here. Can also do lateral tilting. We can, well, this person's a little twisted, but most of the time we can measure angles between the vertebral bodies to the right and to the left. And they're set 
there's established criteria for what's a normal amount and what's not a normal amount. Sometimes there's muscle spasms or patients have a number of levels that are abnormal and we can see more of the problem or specify which is the worst with tilting. Other imaging problems that we may see, um, this is Chiari malformation with syrinx. That Chiari malformation is the back of the brain pushing through the skull base and it's completely filling up this hole. We call it foramen magnum. It means big hole in Latin. And, well, it's, and it's such that the spinal cord normally passes through, but when this back of the brain pushes through, it fills up too much space and there's typically compression. We've noticed that cerebral spinal fluid also doesn't move properly around it, but my thought is it's the compression or nerve impingement on the spinal cord. It's actually being pulled and squeezed that causes the problem. In the spine, normally there's a spinal cord. Here's the bottom, a lower part of it, but it's, we're just getting an edge. But normally there's cerebral spinal fluid surrounding the cord. But in this condition, there's cerebral spinal fluid filling the cord or stretching the cord, and it's pushed all the cerebral spinal fluid that should have been in front and behind the cord away. This is somebody who has spinal stenosis and presented with falling down, trouble feeling in his legs. And stenosis means narrowing. This is his face. That's a nose. These are teeth. This is a tongue. This is the back of the head. And this is the skull base. This is his brain, and this is his spinal cord. And you say, oh, you've got a funny section there. You don't show the whole thing. This is C1, the back of C1. This is C2, so the cord is compressed. And this is a lower level. And this is the back. This is the disc or osteophyte from abnormal movement and arthritis type changes. It's compressing the cord. The cord is flattened, and the nerves don't do well with compression. This is a severe example. And segmentation anomalies, there's a number of different ways the bones can grow abnormally. But in normal bones, there's a bone, a disc, a bone, a disc. This condition, one of the discs didn't form properly and it can generate mechanical problems and it can be associated with pain. So, in summary, we have a number of modalities and a number of measurements that we can make. We can look at rotation, mostly the first two cervical spine segments. We can look at bending forward and back the rest of the spine. We can look at lateral tilt. Sometimes that's helpful in lower levels. And I haven't shown rotation, but that can be looked at to see if one level is worse than another. We have x-rays we can use. We have CT, which is x-rays through a machine. We can use MRI, which is radio frequency uh, utilizing machine. And fluoroscopy, which is essentially motion or uh, rapid x-rays and watching the motion. And we really do this to confirm what's being examined or what the patient is telling their doctor about. We want to provide information for patient care. We want to have it objective, something that anybody can look at and it can't be argued. And having num numeric values, which means numbers or a, a number, can compare to either what the person has had, what other people have, and when we talk to each other, we know the same thing or understand the same thing. Thank you.